Namaskara and good evening. I'm Sanjana Girish, and on behalf of the team at the archives at the National Center for Biological Sciences and our collaborators at the Bangalore International Center, I welcome you all to the inaugural Obeid Siddiqui Lecture. This is the first of three Obeid Siddiqui Lectures. These lectures and the Obeid Siddiqui Chair in the History and Culture of Science have been made possible with the generous support of TNQ Technologies. We thank our supporters and collaborators for helping us bring this event together. The archives at NCBS is a public center for the history of contemporary biology in India. Our primary aim is to house historical material that speaks to the development of sciences in our country. Alongside this core aim, we work towards outreach through workshops, a public lecture series, and exhibitions in our gallery space. We do, the, we do this to engage a variety of audiences with the possibilities that an archive of science holds. The archives at NCBS is closely tied to the, leg to the legacy of Obeid Siddiqui, the founder of NCBS. I would like to invite Dr. Satyajit Mayer, Professor and Center Director of NCBS, to give us insight into how the Obeid Siddiqui Chair in the History and Culture of Science of the Archives has come into being. <clears throat> anyway, uh, uh, thanks, Sanjana, uh, uh, for, for welcoming everyone. I'd also like to add my welcome to you all this evening. Uh, to this inaugural lecture of the Obed Siddiqui Chair in the History and Culture of Science. Uh, but before I begin to tell you about the role of the chair, uh, I must say a few words about Obed himself, uh, in whose name and memory uh, we have instituted this chair. Uh, Obed uh, was, uh, um, was born uh, in 1932 in Basti and um, uh, in Uttar Pradesh and one of seven uh, remarkable children, five of whom were women of extraordinary accomplishment. Uh, and all of them shared a commitment to social transformation that Obed himself was so emblematic of. Obed studied at the Aligarh Muslim University in the late 40s and early 50s, um, and in fact even spent some time in jail for his social activism. However, uh, his fascin fa fascination with science had already begun and this soon lured him away from his activism, but he never lost his sense of social justice and equity. Uh, Obeid spent several years in the UK and in, and in the US, uh, and, his, and it was his easy confidence in himself, which of course came from a combination of background, achievement, and you know, something that we all uh, appreciated, an impersonal focus on the question at stake. And this, uh, led him to return to India to help in building, uh, I, would, I should add, the foundations of modern biology in this country. Uh, starting with the molecular biology unit at the TIFR in the 1960s, uh, to the establishment of the National Center for Biological Sciences in Bangalore in the 1990s, Obed accomplished all this under the umbrella uh, of the Tata Institute for Fundamental Research, uh, where, he event where he served as Professor Emeritus uh, uh, based at NCBS until his untimely demise in 2013. Uh, Obeid um, and the archive in some ways began uh, as, a, as our commitment to, to maintaining some of the things that Obeid cherished uh, and keep them alive. Um, Obeid, of course, leaves behind NCBS as one of his many legacies. Uh, it is today a world-class institution, even if I may say so, uh, deeply engaged with exploring biology across all scales, from molecules to ecosystems with a profoundly interdisciplinary lens. Uh, and it's located just at the northern uh, end of the city, uh, on, well, effectively opposite the old Jakur uh, airport. Uh, and CBS is, um, and hosted, by the way, by the Agriculture, University of Agriculture Sciences, uh, who have been fantastic hosts for the past 20 years. Uh, NCBS has also spawned the Institute of Stem Cell Science in Regenerative Medicine. Uh, it's a place for biomedical translation and the Center for Cell and Molecular Platforms, uh, one of India's top biotech incubators, uh, in partnership with the Department of Biotechnology. Uh, and I welcome those of you who have not visited us to come and see this unique ecosystem of the life sciences right in our own city. Uh, all these efforts are a testimony to the founding principles of open-minded inquiry, uh, clear-headed questioning, 
and a profound commitment to societal engagement uh, that Obaid himself embodied. Uh, we therefore felt, when Obaid passed away, a, a, a deep need uh, to create a chair who would lead a much needed effort to bridge the gap between the sciences, social sciences, and the humanities, and foster a diverse and inclusive community of academics across disciplines. With this focus uh, and the archives as a foundational lab, we imagined that CHAIR would also build teaching and research capacities uh, of academics at the intersection of science and humanities. A key component of this is, uh, is being realized today in the delivery of the Obed Siddiqui CHAIR lectures. Uh, we hope that the, that we, well, we envisage three lectures from a chair every year, uh, which will take place in public spaces in the city. And over the period of time, a sizable number will accumulate to enrich the intellectual life, not only for us in the city, but uh, for our global, global commons. Uh, we've had a wonderful time, well, last year, uh, in exploring uh, the position of, uh, of recruiting somebody to the position of this chair. Uh, and had very many interesting applications. And finally, choosing the inaugural chair, Dr. M.D. Madhusudan, so then, who you will soon find out more about from my colleague uh, Uma Ramakrishnan in a, in a few minutes. Um, but I would like to thank my colleagues on the review committee, Janaki Nair, uh, Ramachandra Gua, Sanjeev Jain, um, Balaram, uh, Janaki Falke, and Uma herself, and of course, our uh, indefatigable head of the archives, Venkat Srinivasan, uh, for their perseverance, their patience, and their selection. This chair was made possible by generous support, as you had just heard, from TNQ Technologies, and the foresight of its chairperson and managing director, Mariam Ram, who also knew and, um, and also knew, respected, and admired Obed and all that he stood for. Uh, while she regrets that she's unable to be with us today, Abhi Abhigyan, the CEO of TNQ, is with us, and I would like to now invite him to say a few words. Thank you for your attention. Good evening. I'm Abhi from TNQ Technologies. Uh, it is my pleasure and privilege to be here for the first Obed Decade Lecture, as Dr. Madhusudan talks about pushing boundaries, the science and politics of mapping nature. Thank you, Professor Mayor, for your kind words acknowledging our support. Uh, Mariam Ram, as you said, is the managing director of TNQ Technologies and uh, uh, the inspiration behind all that TNQ does in the, in the field of uh, research and academics in India. Uh, she couldn't be here today, and I'm making this statement uh, on her behalf, and I quote, the idea of an archive of Indian science that is accessible, focuses on education, and works with other institutions deserves support. TNQ is happy to be part of this progressive initiative in the name of Professor Obed Siddiqui, a scientist whom we greatly admire. The archives at NCBS and TNQ Technologies looks forward to working on this shared vision to nurture environments for the rigorous interrogation of the history and culture of science in India. With Dr. H.T. Madhusudan as the first Obed Siddiqui chair, I am confident that this archive project will achieve its goals and objectives. I hope uh, you will enjoy this lecture. I surely will. Uh, have a good evening. Thank you, Abhi. Now I would like to call upon Dr. Uma Ramakrishnan, Professor and Head of Outreach and Development at NCBS, to introduce Dr. M.D. Madhusudan, the current Obed Siddiqui Chair and our speaker for today. Thanks, Anjana. And thanks, everyone, for being here. So it's a great pleasure to introduce Madhu, whom uh, I've known for more than 20 years. Uh, Madhu uh, is from Mysore. He did his bachelor's there and from very early on was fascinated by nature, uh, did a master's at the Wildlife Institute of India. And I think those two years were really transformative because they helped build uh, lifelong relationships uh, which, which grew much more than you know, just being friendships, uh, resulting in one of the foremost uh, nature conservation, knowledge-based nature conservation organizations in India today the Nature Conservation Foundation. So Madhu, uh, with others, co-founded NC, uh, NC, NCF, uh, and then uh, continued his uh, inquiry into how wildlife and nature uh, can be brought, uh, can not you know, uh, trade off each other. 
wildlife and people, sorry, I should say. So, um, this is something which we all struggle with in India, and I think Madhu uh, is one of the people who's really thought about this a lot, uh, in a lot of depth. Uh, how can we continue to have nature, continue to have all of these wild species, at the same time uh, do this in a way which is friendly to people? So um, I'm very happy to have Madhu uh, give the first, uh, be the first uh, Obeid Siddiqui chair. Uh, he's a deep thinker and a scholar, and I'm sure you'll see that in his presentation today. Um, we're honored to have him with us at NCBS for this year. Uh, Madhu. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, I'm deeply honored to hold the Obeid Siddiqui chair at the in the history and culture of science and thank the National Center for Biological Sciences for the opportunity and for their trust. I also thank TNQ Technologies for their support to this position and to the archives at NCBS where I've been based. I'd also like to thank countless colleagues over the years from whom I have learned and I continue to learn so very much. In the English satirist Lewis Carroll's last novel, Sylvie and Bruno concluded, there's a conversation between the narrator, a historian from London, and a character called Mine Hare, who's a traveler from a distant planet that has experienced and dealt with most of the things that we on Earth are currently grappling. And here is a part of their chat. What a useful thing the, a pocket map is, I remarked. That's another thing we've learned from your nation, said Mine Hare, map making. But we've carried it much further than you. Do you consider the largest, what do you consider the largest map that would be really useful? About six inches to the mine? Only six inches, exclaimed mine hare. We've very soon got to six yards to a mile. Then we tried a hundred yards to the mile and then came to the grandest idea of all. We actually made a map of the country on the scale of a mile to the mile. Have you used it much? I inquired. It has never been spread out yet, said mine hair. The farmers objected. They said it would cover the whole country and shut out the sunlight. So we now use the country itself as its own map. And I assure you, it does nearly as well. Half a century later, picking up where mine hair left off, the Argentinian writer Jorge Luis Borges wrote in a short one-paragraph story titled On Exactitude in Science. In that empire, the art of cartography attained such perfection that the map of a single province occupied the entirety of a city and the map of the empire, the entirety of a province. In time, those unconscionable maps no longer satisfied and the cartographer's guild stuck a map of the empire whose size was that of the empire and which coincided point for point with it. The following generations who were not so fond of the study of cartography as their forebears had been saw that the vast map was useless and not without some pitilessness was it that they delivered it up to the inclemencies of sun and winters. In the deserts of the west still today there are tattered ruins of that map inhabited by animals and beggars in all the land, there is no other relic of the disciplines of geography. What stands out in these passages from Carroll and, and Borges is the absurdity of the idea that a map can faithfully and accurately reproduce the territory that it's about. As the Polish-American philosopher Alfred Korzybski famously and succinctly said, the map is not the territory. The possibility of a map is that it interprets and represents territory which exists in the material domain onto a mental realm. Its power, on the other hand, is that it often also serves as the aspirational template for the powerful to rearrange and remake territory. In today's talk, I'll attempt a closer and a critical examination of the process of mapping nature, the impulses that cause them to be drawn the emphasis and the erasures that maps inevitably contain, 
the conflicts they can and have engendered, and finally, the impacts of these on territory. I also look at maps as commentary and as visions for territory and as the first tool in reshaping and remaking territory in a way that suits power. In his fascinating book, Seeing Like a State, the political scientist James Scott recounts a story from 18th century Prussia, that is today's Germany. A man called Johann Gottlieb Beckmann assembled a group of people and lined them up in a forest. He made the group then walk slowly, side by side, as if searching for something lost in the woods. They carried a box with five compartments, each with a certain number of colored nails, each coding for the size of a tree, which they had been trained to estimate. As they walked, they stopped at every tree uh, they met, sized it up, and drove into it a nail of the appropriate color. Thus, they walked, tagging each tree until their sample forest plot had been fully covered. When they were done, the remaining number of nails of each color was counted and subtracted from the initial totals. What Gottfried, what Johann Gottfried Beckmann had done with his team was to find a way of inventorying trees by size class in a given area of forest. The reason Beckmann did this was because he wanted to make a map. Not the Google Maps kind we use when we find our way around a new place, but the kind that tells the state how much of a natural resource, timber in this case, was available to be harvested from the forests. Beckman's work was tremendously important and did strange things to Germany's forests. To get from the numbers and sizes of trees to the amount of timber they held, Beckman and his colleagues needed to come up with an idealized tree. This was nothing like the real trees that bent and branched in unruly ways. It approximated a tall cone with its top chopped off. They even had a name for it. It was called the normal baum, translating approximately to the normal or the average tree. So, the normal baums were put into varying size classes from one to five. Over time, Germany's forests began to resemble the trees in Beckman's map more and more. Foresters planted trees of the same species, usually the Norwegian spruce, at the same time, so they grew straight and tall in their neat rows. The undergrowth was cleared, so you could see and count an entire strand stand at one go. So, the Norwegian spruce, in a sense, became the physical manifestation of the normal baum. This project was a great success. Germany had large profitable crops of Norwegian spruce. Also, by radically narrowing its vision of a forest to commercial wood, Germany developed a scientific way of abstracting a forest in terms of its inventory, growth, and yield. This also helped Germany build its reputation and influence in forestry and silviculture. Soon, to call yourself a forester at the time, you had to be trained in German methods. Over time, Germans gained expertise in creating and managing a new, more legible forest. Tall, dense stands of trees in neat rows became a powerful aesthetic for a well-managed forest. And a forester inspected his forest just as a commander did his troops on parade, replacing diverse deciduous forests with conifers like Norwegian spruce was a disaster for peasants who lost grazing, food, raw materials, and medicines. At the same time, unauthorized disturbances, whether by fire or by local communities, were seen as threats to management and heavily controlled. By the 1850s, the German forest had become the archetype for disciplining nature under the orderly constructs of science. Around that time, in faraway India, the British, who were worried about the declining availability of oak and other hardwoods at home for shipbuilding, were gratefully switching to teak and had also begun to use pine and salt timber as sleepers for the vast railway that they were laying across the subcontinent. Realizing that the forests that they initially saw and termed as wastelands were indeed valuable, both strategically and economically, they brought in the German foresters to map and manage India's forests scientifically. 
Within a year of founding the Imperial Forest Department in 1864, a new law, the Indian Forest Act, was enacted and the colonial state began taking over India's forests, previously held under diverse ownership and access systems, and making them the property of the government and harnessing them for the pursuit of scientific forestry. Alongside using its already formidable scientific capabilities at survey and mapping, the Survey of India, which the East India Company had set up nearly a century earlier, started to map India's forests. Thanks to the head start the foresters got from the Survey of India to map the territory of the British colonial state, it became possible to more sharply and clearly focus the ambitions of the Imperial Forest Department to annex more and more forests as government property. Meanwhile, back in Germany, the science of forestry had continued to improvise and learn, often the hard way that the mass die-offs, or forest die-offs that they called Waldsterben, the declining yields of Norwegian spruce and the pest outbreaks in the forests, among other calamities, were possible to address by making the forests more diverse, somewhat like what they were before the advent of scientific forestry. But these realizations would take a lot longer, if at all, for India's cult of scientific forestry to accept and address. Back in India, by 1930, over 850,000 square kilometers of India, including its principalities, was under forest. Although the Imperial Forest Department ceased to exist as a federal department after the Government of India Act was passed in 1935, the colonial impulse, as well as the statutory structures of the Indian Forest Act under which it had been functioning, remained intact. Thereafter, a succession of crises and responses, including the war, the famine, and the Gromo food campaign, increased the pressure for forest land to go under the axe and to be brought under the plough. After 1947, the newly independent Indian state prioritized an expansion of agriculture, industry, energy, and infrastructure. Over the next three decades, an estimated 43,000 square kilometers of forest land was officially diverted to these uses. Presumably, even greater amounts of forests having been cleared unofficially. Studies estimate that over 200,000 square kilometers of forests were lost between 1930 and 1975. This led to a renewed concern in the Indian government that the extent of forests need, uh, needed more careful monitoring. And this figured prominently as a priority in the deliberations of the National Commission on Agriculture, headed by Nathuram Mirda. In its wake, it was decided to establish the Forest Survey of India with uh, the specific mandate to map and monitor India's forests. The FSI, since 1987, has been publishing a biennial India State of Forest report, which summarizes the data from their exercise to map and measure India's forests. Over the last 35 years, the key trends that these maps report are a steady increasing trend in forest cover after 1999. This accounts for an increase of nearly 81,000 square kilometers. At this point, it's important to distinguish between two different ways of mapping and measuring the extent of India's forests. Each approach simplifies the forest in a particular way to make it mappable. The first uses forest area, more precisely what is called the recorded forest area. This is the sum total of all lands legally notified as forests. In other words, these are lands that are forests under law. Based on the latest India State of Forest reports, India's recorded forest area now extends over an area of over 770,000 square kilometers. The second uses forest cover. This is based on a technical definition whereby any area with 10% canopy density extending over at least a hectare is defined as a forest. Such a definition is necessary to classify a forest using pixels from a satellite image rather than on the basis of legal status. Based on the latest India State of Forest reports, India's forest cover extends over an area of 710,000 square kilometers. Now, which of the two numbers, which differ by over 60,000 square kilometers, 
both presented in the same India State of Forest report, which is the one that represents the actual extent of India's forests. And what does the difference between these numbers represent? Let's take a closer look. Uh, only about 516,000 square kilometers of the 775,000 square kilometers, that's about two thirds of India's recorded forest area contains forest cover, which means that nearly 200,000 square kilometers of India's forests uh, occurs on lands that are legally not forests, which brings us to two open questions. First, if not forest, what is the land cover in the 258,000 square kilometers of recorded forest area that does not have forest cover? Second, who owns the lands over which nearly 200,000 square kilometers of our forest cover occurs? Neither the maps of the recorded forest area nor the maps of forest cover are proactively made available freely and publicly by the government. But based on data publicly hosted on some of its websites, we are able to steal a look at what the FSI's forest cover maps look like. So, in these pictures, what I'm going to show you are the, the maps of forest cover overlaid on various landscapes where the, the Forest Survey of India categorizes this into open, moderately dense and very dense forests. And this gives you a picture. The, the, the first picture is going to have an area in green which shows where the forest cover is and the second one in this sequence will show you what is actually there under the area that is being called forest. So this is, let's start from northeastern India. This is the area around Naxalbari where tea estates are classified as open, moderately dense and very dense forests. So, Similarly, in the tea estates of Valparai in Tamil Nadu, you again have forest cover showing up uh, in those areas. A little to the north of Valparai, when you get into the, the busy areas around Polachi town, which is full of coconut groves, you see a lot of those areas again showing up and getting counted as forests. The entire islands of Lakshadweep, which are covered with uh, uh, coconuts are, are under which a very dense human population resides is also an area of forest in the India State of Forest uh, uh, report and the maps. Similarly, in the suburbs of Calcutta, trees around houses show up as forests and are counted as forests. So this obviously wants us to make look for, uh, uh, find out more. And I decided to look at Lutian's Delhi and see if there were forests there too. And yes, the highest functionaries of our government reside in moderate to openly open uh, uh, forests. So in, in, a, in a sense, they are forest dwellers too. Uh, then, of course, having gone this far, I had to look for forests in the desert. And find them I did. In the areas of Jaisalmer, there were forests. In, in areas that actually look like this. Not only that, we were also calling as forests and prosopis, an invasive species that had come and had placed a lot of pressure on, on ecological landscapes that were otherwise open. Those two were being counted as our forests. So, to come back, we have uh, just uh, based on what we saw, there are two, two key takeaways. First, based on how a forest is defined, the same agency of government offers us two maps that differ wildly in terms of what it, they call forests, where they are located and what the extent of these forests is. So the, in the green are areas that are shown as forest cover. In the pink are areas that are shown as forest area. So these are legally forest. As you see, there are large areas in the pink that don't have forest cover and there are areas which are uh, in green that are, occur outside the boundaries, legal boundaries of forests. Second, why would the India State of Forest report 
continue to offer two completely different and unreconciled ways of mapping our forests, report after report, one can only hope to infer that intent indirectly to present the map of a recorded forest area regardless of whether it has forest cover at all helps to assert and consolidate the state's continuing ownership over these lands. Similarly, a definition of the forest that includes coconut groves, orchards, suburban tree-clad areas, tree-lined boulevards in metropolises, and even desert scrub as forest cover helps represent the territory of the forest uh, way beyond its legal boundaries, claim an increase in the current country's forest cover as these anthropogenic land covers expand and paradoxically even take credit for it. So meanwhile, any injury to the territory of the forest, as happens when you're diverting forest land, natural forests, to, uh, towards energy, industry, or infrastructure projects, could now be healed on the map, as it shows more and more human-modified lands as forests. So, On the other hand, if we, were different, if we were a different government agency or from academia, using the authority of science rather than the formal authority of state to map forests, we might employ a different definition of a forest and arrive at completely different maps of the forest. Such different maps indeed exist and they tell very different stories about what is going on with our forests. So what I want to point out is the top line that is in pink, which is going upwards, is the official forest cover data. The blue line below is from the National Remote Sensing Agency. The pink line, sorry, the one below in purple is from the National Remote Sensing Agency's land use land cover maps. It doesn't show any such increase. And another assessment by the National Remote Sensing Agency shows a, a slow but definite decline and a group of academics who have estimated forest cover in India and, and globally over a period that overlaps with these assessments, again shows no discernible change in, in uh, forest cover. So, switching gears now, if to this entire mix we were to add biodiversity and wildlife to the forest that we have been considering so far, the state's impulse to protect nature is only strengthened. Since 1972, after the Wildlife Protection Act was passed, the state has systematically been creating protected areas in which the needs of wildlife are meant to take precedence over human interests. But in too many of our protected areas, map after map of the areas notified for protection is more wishful than real. One simple reason is that a great many of them pretend that the forests they seek to protect are only that, forests. That they are not homes to families, or commons to end communities, or foundries of culture and identity, or workplaces for those who are kept out of formal economies. Here is a map of Indravati Tiger Reserve in central, area today, central India today. The lighter blotches you see uh, are religious inside the park, going back to 1973, long before this land had acquired the level of legal protection it has today. It is, this is the same area seen by the satellite five decades ago, and they're pretty much the same villages showing up as very similar white blotches. In these 50 years, this area went from being a game sanctuary to becoming a wildlife sanctuary to a national park and now a tiger reserve which is like the Bharat Ratna or the crown jewel among our forests. During each of these elevations in protection levels, the law provides for and in fact requires that the rights by which we mean claims over land of people living in the area must be recognized and only then, if need be, acquired by government. So sections 18 to 25 of the Wildlife Protection Act, the intent in them is to ensure that in the process of notifying protected areas, we don't trample over the rights of communities. They are given the opportunity to represent their claims, which are then settled, uh, recognized and settled, and only thereafter a protected area is notified. So these are, are the specific sections that, that 
uh, allow you to do that. But Indravati goes ahead and notifies a wildlife sanctuary without any record of how those processes that were meant as safeguards for people who already resided and had rights in that area had, had been dealt with. Similarly, the, for national parks, there are very similar safeguards. And here again in Indravati, we go from a wildlife sanctuary to a national park where all rights are supposed to have been acquired by government and extinguished, which essentially means there's nobody with any rights and all the forest land is completely inviolate. And that's the stage at which you notify a national park. This too, again, is done without, uh, uh, without addressing this provision in the Wildlife Protection Act. After the FRA, the Wildlife Protection Act got amended and the Tiger Reserve made very specific requirements of uh, approaching tiger conservation without affecting the rights of scheduled tribes and other forest dwellers and to ensure that their livelihood and all of those are addressed before a tiger reserve is notified. Indravati thereafter, even after the FRA, goes ahead and gets notified as a tiger reserve. Again, these, the, the way these requirements have been addressed remain completely uh, outside of, of all of this. So, from what we know, at no point was any of this done in Indravati in terms of the safeguards to address local rights and honor them. The mapped boundary of this protected area came into existence and became official entirely without consulting the people who lived within that boundary. And now, even as the forest's protection status saw elevation after elevation, the original denied and thus the original denial and thus erasure of the, their presence has remained uncorrected, leaving the villages of Indravati without the right to live where and how they do. Uh, so, these once fictional maps of people-free protected areas, once these near fictional maps of people-free protected areas are drawn up, the presence of actual human beings on the territory becomes, an even more of, becomes even more of a nuisance than before. Facts must now be made to fit the fictions. Uh, people must be removed from the territory, rendering it as pristine as the map itself. So after not using a single opportunity provided under the Wildlife Act to recognize uh, uh, and settle and acquire the rights of communities, Having done nothing, in 2018, the NTCA does an assessment where they say villages located, in, they say that there are all these people who reside there, they, uh, they indulge in their traditional hunting, extend agriculture, there is encroachment, felling, cattle grazing, firewood collection and other MFP collection. As a result, the objectives and goals of the Tiger Reserve are not achieved. Villages located in, the, in remote parts of the core area need to be relocated soon. This is the conclusion to which we come uh, uh, at the end of all of this. Unfortunately, Indravati is hardly the only example of such a fictional map leading to conflicts in the territory. Nearly every protected area in India is a litany of such conflict. Closer to here, the Soliga people of Biligirang and Betta have also been subject to similar trials. So they. I mean, let me read out the operational part that the, in, again in the assessment of B BRT Tiger Reserve, they say that the demand of the Soligas for forests, electricity, a school and a hospital as well as community forest rights which have not been granted is a constant headache for the authorities of the reserve. And again, exactly like Indravati, none of the uh, rights of this community have been addressed or settled in the multiple opportunities there have been under the Wildlife Act to follow and do this in, 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 the, uh, in the due legal process. The loss of our democratic nation state give it the power to accord grade, graded value and protections to different types of land. Despite the fact that these laws provide for processes that could make the map truer to the territory, our maps are drawn today by map makers who sit at vast social and cultural distances from the map. A map drawn today that will not acknowledge the Soliga or the Durva village is a mere myth.
a fantasy of power aided and abetted by knowledge and technology. Why then would a map showing the same lands as a soligar sees them be any less valid? This counter map of the very area known elsewhere as BR Hills Tiger Reserve shows the Soliga cultural sites of, cult sites of cultural, social and ritual significance and has helped the community secure community forest rights under the Forest Rights Act of 2006. Yet, a map of community forests that recognizes and records Soliga claims over territory remains completely unreconciled with the uh, unreconciled with the map of the protected area. So there is a Soliga map of their traditional lands, but it remains completely unreconciled with the map of the protected area, which persists with its fictional notions of a people-free forest. Strangely though, some types of human presence and activity seem to escape the very stringent filters of the PM map. Even as it continues to pursue the creation of Soliga Free BRT Tiger Reserve, the very same map graciously acknowledges and defers to the lease rights of a handful of commercial estates that hold more land in BRT Tiger Reserve than the entire Soliga community. A PA map that remains at odds with its territory and what is integral to the territory is as good as an invitation to battle. A boundary that is not agreed on by those it includes excludes or even occludes is one that is bound to be pushed at from all directions. While maps can certainly be scientific or technical or legal even representations of territory, they need not be. A mapping exercise can also begin with a deeply normative stance, as for instance with wastelands. Wastelands, unlike forests, are not a natural category of land. They are constructed socially and historically. It was the 17th century English philosopher John Locke who held that lands that existed in a state of nature where people simply enjoyed the fruits of the earth was waste, whereas lands actually gained in value when people applied their labor to privately appropriate, enclose and intensively cultivate it. Not only did he argue that wild woods and waste exist in many continents, but also that their wasteful use justified their appropriation by an improving hand from England, thus providing a very persuasive and powerful rationale for the colonial ambition. He said, and I quote, land that is left wholly to nature, that hath no improvement of pasturage, tillage or planting is called, as it indeed is, waste and we shall find, it the benefit of, find the benefit of it amount to little more than nothing. This idea of his undergirded early colonial land settlement. Thus, wastelands were not, as we might imagine, a category applied to infertile, barren or rocky lands. It was a social category that applied to the supposedly unproductive uses that lands were put to and to, left, and to land left idle and to lands held in common. This also enabled a deeper categorization of people into productive cultivating groups and non-productive groups based on how they use the land. Generating value from wastelands was thus a means by which not just the land but also its inhabitants could be disciplined. Although we have come a long way in time, and we are no longer a colony to the empire, Locke's essential ideas about wastelands continued to find powerful resonance within the Indian state. Thus, we continue to systematically seek and map India's wastelands with the aim of developing them and making them more productive. So what are these wastelands? How do they look? So this are a series of pictures of wastelands from across India. They include the dunes of Jaisalmer, the grasslands of uh, uh, Maharashtra and Madhya Pradesh, the scrub areas that extend over very large areas, uh, and in, in the ravines in areas like Chambal and so on, and the vast savanna woodlands across large parts of India. With India being mostly semi-arid, we fail to recognize that there is a very large area in this country, almost at par with the extent of forests we have, that are what we call open natural ecosystems, which are currently largely uh, seen as wastelands. 
So this is more of a view from, from the ground. These areas are also important, exceedingly important for wildlife. If, uh, so many species that are actually uh, quintessentially Indian, like the black buck or the wolf or the lesser florican and the Rajasthan toad-headed lizard, there are so many of these species or the great Indian bustard are unique to these areas and do not occur anywhere else outside of India. So these lands not only hold uh, unique and endemic wildlife species found nowhere else, they are, th th these habitats of these species are also under serious siege. But all these species for generations have lived alongside a very wide range of uses of these lands, which have largely been pastoral because they're so marginal in their productivity. But this has yielded an incredible diversity of agro-pastoral lifestyles, the associated cultures, identities, providing livelihood to millions, possibly hundreds of millions of people across the country. And yet, we have the Wasteland Atlas of India, which is produced regularly. And the latest one has mapped over 550,000 square kilometers of land in the country as wastelands. Across these wastelands today, there are many energetic plans being drawn and implemented to bring a range of productivity enhancements and developments such as soil conservation measures, groundwater recharge, tube well irrigation, solar and wind energy projects, tree planting programs, as well as, as, well as commercial plantations of crops like oil palm. Such a transformation and disciplining of the territory based on the interpretation that they are wastelands carries very significant ecological and social costs. The wasteland map we make has condemnation written all over it, both for these lands and their people. This makes the map not merely an accessory to the remaking of this territory, but its very architect. In the social hierarchy of India's biologically valuable ecosystems, its grasslands, scrublands, woodlands, ravines, rocky areas and dunes do not enjoy the same dignity and privilege with the state that say our forests do. Their vast ecological, uh, social, economic and cultural values not only are under denial, but they are actually under active deletion. A recent countermapping effort that I undertook with my colleague Abhitamim from Atri has tried to reimagine this, the map of what have been called wastelands as a range of vibrant open natural ecosystems, no less deserving of care and concern than our forests. I would like to end with a series of maps from BR Hills showing how each of these different kinds of maps of, of nature and territory imagine and represent, uh, represent, uh, represent this territory. The first is a map of this, of their homeland and cultural sites made by the Soliga. And the next four maps I'm going to show you are maps of the same area made by different government departments, showing it simultaneously as valuable and as waste. So this is a map of wasteland and degraded forests. The, the, the green is not my coloring. All the green is you know, it's, it's, this is taken from the Wasteland Atlas. Green on the Wasteland Atlas represents degraded forest. It is categorized as wasteland. In the same remarkable location, we also find forest cover. Forest cover that goes all the way from open to very dense. And in the same territory, we find it worthy of being protected, of en en enclosing it as legal forest land, and notifying it as a protected area. And lo and behold, this is also an area with very high tiger densities. So this same site is it's possible to represent all of these as, as maps of this very same territory. So what we see of the world and how we map it depends on where we stand. None of these maps is invalid, but neither are they self-contained. Each gives expression to a very particular interpretation of the territory. It is only as the boundaries of each of these maps pushes against the boundaries of the others 
they allow us to more fully grasp the different meanings these maps convey and let us get a better picture of the complexity and contradictions that characterize the territory. Thus, every map about nature inevitably shrinks, reshapes and simplifies the territory it is about. Indeed, that is the job of every map. And it is in such a modeling of territory that a map offers value. Yet, it is not a model we would do, yet it is only a model and we would do well to remember what the statistician George Box had the chance, if he had the chance, might well have said about our maps, that all maps are wrong, but some are useful. Thank you. Thank you, Madhu, for this very insightful lecture. The manner in which you drew connections between the idea of a map, uh, humans, and other species was very fascinating. Um, we are now open for questions from members of the audience. Uh, we'll, we will be passing around mics. Uh, mics. Uh. Uh, thank you, Madhu. Utterly fascinating talk. I don't have a question. I have a, uh, a query. Who drew the Soligama? And how was that drawn? Because that, that would be really interesting and you would talk about that. I, is Nitin here? No. Uh, uh, maybe there are people who have participated more closely with this than I have. So uh, I, I stand to be corrected. But my understanding is that, and, and I know this not just from the way Soliga maps have been drawn, but from colleagues and how they've drawn maps with and for indigenous communities across uh, the globe. So this is involved sitting with the Soliga, essentially providing the technical backstopping to, to use Soliga elders to look at narratives, to, 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 to look at their entire oral histories of these landscapes and, and, and what their significance has been. And to bring that, so it's in, involved a lot of detail and long term uh, and, and, and very minute conversations with the community, visits to those sites, and documenting each of those things before it has eventually been put on the map. Atri, I think, provided the technical backstopping to the community which uh, did the map. And in very similar ways, people have tried to do this too, uh, of, in, in mapping of a variety of areas, so starting from I mean, areas of uh, in, uh, indigenous nations in Canada, and I know people who have done this very much in the reefs and atolls of, uh, of, uh, of the Pacific Islands and so on. And many of them have also, it's, it's been, if you noticed, the, the Soliga map was in Canada. No map that a Soliga ever gets to see is in a language that is even accessible. It's, it, it's, it completely excludes them. To have a map that also uh, is, is not just prepared by, but intelligible to the entire community is a very important thing. And in many places, people have even moved further beyond where they have done the entire mapping itself as an oral exercise, where in each of the places you can actually go to various points on the map and click, and you have an elder telling you the entire story, the crea the, the, how that location is associated with a creation myth, with a, with a deity, and, and, and so on. And these, there are very, very rich ways in which such uh, uh, local mythologies, cultures, and, and traditions have been mapped by people who have essentially provided the technical backstopping. And this, I think, is an important thing because t what technology has done. So when we went from map making to cartography, the bar was raised. It made map making less accessible to people. It made it more scientific, more rigorous, more mathematical, and therefore it became less accessible to people. But technology in many ways, and one can't, one can't make too much of this, but undeniably technology has democratized access of these maps and even the making of these maps. Otherwise, these people were merely subjects that the map uh, of, of areas that were made in maps. They had no idea about them. The maps were made about them, about their territory, about what they could do and they could not do, and boundaries were drawn in a way that completely left them out, not just in the process of 
creating them, but also in, in, in the entire, even in, from the consumption of these maps. Now I think technology has really, really uh, democratized this and made it more possible at least for a pushback, to push back against that boundary. Thank you uh, for that excellent uh, talk, very insightful, and also for your extra extraordinary presentation, which uh, really uh, you know, threw light on a number of things which we were not aware of. Uh, I had a question uh, about something which you didn't mention. I'm wondering what the cartographic impulse for joint forest management was, and what the fate of that has been. Because to my understanding, it was indeed uh, involving communities it had a very specific kind of uh, impulse that wanted to redress gender inequalities and so on. So, you know, what has the fate of that been and, and what was the impulse for even that initiative? Again, I, I may not be the most knowledgeable person uh, to speak about this, but the way I understand uh, joint forest management, that it was much more, uh, it was with criticisms accumulating about how exclusionary uh, the, the colonial model of uh, forest reservation and forest conservation had been and, and how it had excluded all possibilities of engagement with local communities other than, you know, in, 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 in enforcing laws against trespass and all of those things, the engagement with communities or preventing uh, forest fires or getting nursery work done for nurseries, there was really no engagement. And I think uh, the way I have understood it, it was much more a response to that criticism where the essential power to make decisions over the territory still remained with the forest department, but the language changed the language of participation came in. They were token, uh, they were, of course, I'm, I'm really, uh, it's, it's very, very diverse. There are places where it worked much more, where the spirit of it was honored. There were places where it was merely a change in language without an accompanying change in behavior. But I think it sent the, the, the way I have understood the impulse, it was much, it was more to take it from exclusion to participation and still it remained very far away from empowerment. Um, yeah, thank you for a very insightful talk. Uh, I have a lot of questions, but I'll try to limit to two. Um, one is the very basics. I mean, if forests are interpreted in so many different ways, I mean, how should we understand forests? What is a forest? And I mean, maybe it's not important, but I think whether it's from indigenous communities, from in quotes, naturalists, because they come in all uh, shapes and sizes. But uh, how should we understand a forest and, um, you know, what is it that we are protecting? That's my first question. Second is regard, uh, with regards to wastelands. I mean, uh, there is this entire drive to uh, divert wastelands for, you know, solar panels and all these kinds of things. But even before that, like starting from the 50s, at least with land reforms, and Garibi Hatao, you know, all these various campaigns when land was to be distributed to the poor, mainly the Dalits. What ended up happening was all these wastelands, all these so-called, you know, um, uh, be because land reforms wasn't successful, the land that reached the poor, the Dalits was this marginal land uh, on which they tried to grow and they're not successful and therefore they're considered poor farmers. You know, there's this entire politics. So how do we... Um, uh, I mean, uh, and, and there is this continuing aspiration. There are continuing struggles across the country for land ownership, which ends up being these wastelands. So how do we negotiate our space in this, um, you know, complex situation? Okay. Um, the, f the answer to your first question, how must we understand the forest and how sh uh, should we protect it when there are so many representations of the forest? I think it's really important to recognize that a forest is an interpreted space. It's not, it's not, it's not merely, it doesn't only exist in the material realm so that you just go and have some, you know, objective way of, of defining and measuring it. And you just, it's, it's a quest for the better way or the best way to understand and map forests. But because these, I mean, it's a, 
it's the home for biodiversity it's the habitat for a myriad species it's a production frontier it's a place that gives identity to people it's so many different things to so many different people that i think the only reasonable way of actually trying to understand a forest is not to have one but to look at all and to actually see what they each of them is is saying and to be able to triangulate to a view of a forest or what 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 it could be or as as i as i've been trying to say for the for the different maps that exist for them to become invitations to a conversation about what is a forest how must we actually measure and map this and actually i go back to the very first state of forest report it's really slim but it's an extraordinary document it covers so many different facets to the forest which is not a single uh, monolithic thing it has so many of these different facets even in the slim report of 40 or so pages that it was it managed to get the issues related to production issues related to diversion and economic growth issues related to shifting cultivation a variety of ways in which forests were being used and related to and what that meant to the state of forest and today we have 600 to 800 pages but it doesn't touch upon any of these it's just full of tables and numbers without touching on the essential vital parts of what a forest is and how people must relate to it so i don't know if that's a satisfactory answer for how we should uh, understand and map and measure forests but that's that that's how i feel the on wastelands i think a very large part of these wastelands have been landscapes that have been used by people for a very long time the property rights under which people have traditionally used these marginal marginal for agriculture lands that are marginal for agriculture is largely through pastoralism and so on so it was always a, a source of enormous irritation to the state that there were people who couldn't be sedentarized these more savage uh versus the civilized people who you know who cultivated in a, who stayed put who cultivated in an area gave up the taxes these were people who moved all the time and this was actually a reflection of the nature of seasonality and productivity within this this frontier so a large uh, uh, uh and then this is a very complex tenurial system where someone comes to a place year after year not residing permanently or having a sense it belongs to them but using this in turn with other people for a variety of different things these kind of systems disappeared and i my suspicion is that a large part of these areas that were waste nobody resided and so on were essentially denials of a much more complex universe of tenurial and land rights which uh, have have not been recognized even today under the forest rights act the pastoralists have the opportunity to have their rights recognized but it's been very hard if you are a gujar if you are a rabadi in any of these communities have had a very hard time getting rights and the 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 nature of of their production system and their identity is so complex and 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 the way land has become uh, the, the sedentarization of production has made it really hard for them so i think to come back to what you were saying i would imagine that a that a significant portion of all of these lands that were distributed to other backward i mean uh, communities and so on might have been land that were of which some other even more backward people perhaps were dispossessed so i don't know the the answer to the other part of the question the trade off that you're hinting at about using these lands as as offering them as areas for production versus the impulse to try and protect them i really don't know what the uh, how we should be negotiating that maybe we can talk a bit more any other questions could i also request uh, uh, the people to just introduce themselves yeah. before they ask the yeah. question uh, i am pradeep sinha from 
I had to go on previous. <laughs> Give me long to attend. Yeah, uh, I'm left quite bewildered with the whole story. Uh, it must be true for all other countries, or is it a very specific story for India? Your uh, German story of you know cultivated forest, we have seen that they look all you know, artificially made. We did not do such things in India possibly, or did we? And has it happened everywhere? And we are for the first time kind of you know, grappling with the problem of multiple definitions of forest and policies and all of that. Uh, I don't know if I completely got the first. Yeah. Can so you elaborate else, a little uh, bit on the first part of your yeah, question? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I want to repeat. Who, which other country did better than this? When you, when you said this, I talked about protected areas for right, right, right. So, I don't know what, did, was there any other country? Can you cite of, of another instance? Look, how well they have managed their uh, forest, not following the path that we have followed for the last hundred years. Um, I think this is. I mean, there are historians who have studied this. Uh, a lot more closely than I have, so I would, I would, uh, I wouldn't not want to second guess those kind of. Uh, so it's not something I'm, I'm very uh, aware of or knowledgeable about. But I think across the empire, most most colonies where where, where nature was uh, became natural resources upon commodification. I think the 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 larger impulse to maximize production out of an ecological unit rather than optimize it for multiple kinds of values that it was offering has, has been uh, the trend. And I think, uh, in, in like, like I said, with Germany and so on, they had a, a significant amount of setbacks with that way of trying to have a monochromatic view of the forest and trying to maximize production for one thing. And eventually, I think a large part of their discovery and learning has been to, to value the diversity that they originally displaced from those areas as a very important way of being able to give these, even, even forestry, the necessary resilience and, and, uh, and, and ability to deal with uncertainty of, of various kinds. Um, uh, the second question about multiple kinds of definitions of forests and how they are uh, they are mapped, I think I would like to think in many places the conversation around forests is a lot more open. Uh, I, I, I don't I don't think it is it is the case everywhere, but I can tell you from a colleague who's been working in Brazil, he used to head the forest the the forestry service. But today, they have an effort to map not just forests, but other uh, varied kinds of land covers in, in, in Brazil. And that is a project that is not undertaken, as is the case in India, by one agency not talking to anybody else. It is something they do collaboratively with a variety of different people. So when you are able to account for all the various differences uh, and, and perspectives in how a for, a one, what a forest is, how it must be defined, how it must be measured, I think the map you produce is not only significantly better in terms of hopefully the scientific rigor is, is preserved, but I think the social acceptability of it, the way it reflects the aspirations of different groups of people or the understandings of different groups of people also is reflected in the map that you produce. So this you know the, the 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 kind of very disjointed idea of what, of calling this uh, uh, in in one way of looking at it it's the it's the crown jewel of your uh, forest because it's a tiger reserve and it has tigers and all of that another department of the same government is calling it wasteland so this kind this absence of reconciliation i think really speaks to the manner in which we lack a conversation about these things. I think if the conversation preceded the mapping, we would not have to contend with multiple maps 
that are very hard to reconcile. And I think that's, that's also partly an answer to what you're saying. Thank you, Madhu. I enjoyed listening to how you bring the normative and the analytical together to provide a framework for understanding forest mapping in India. But it's mapping you do, right? And so I'm going to push you on the question that Ram started out with, which is how do you do the maps that you do, right? Because you're asking for a, converse, a, a conversation prior to mapping on several fronts, but there is a certain kind of mapping exercise that you yourself are engaged in. So how do you, so, you know, simply, I mean, technology is not simply democratizing. I mean, you know, as, as sort of my favorite statement about, from Kranzberg's laws of technology, technology is neither good nor bad nor neutral. So if we begin from that point, how are you, what is the team that does this mapping, right? What comprises this team? Who are you talking to? What, what is this unproblematic elders that has been presented at least today, right? So who are the people you talk to? How do you prioritize? Whose stories do you prioritize? Are you aware of the kind of, you know, uh, I, I'm sure you are, but in what ways are you acting upon that awareness of what you're prioritizing certain stories does to the social structure on the ground between the Soliga community, for example, right? Which is what, you know, anthropologists you know, do all the time. So I'd love to understand how you engage in the mapping yourself after having given us clearly a fabulous coming together of the normative and the analytical as far as just the exercise of mapping goes. So are you, are you asking me about how I might I might make the maps myself or are, are you asking? Uh, uh, so so, so you, you are engaged in mapping yourself, right? Like Correct. You do, yes. So how do you do that? So, you know, since you're saying, since you're, you're, you've made us You've alerted us to the problematic nature of the various kinds of maps. Yes. How do you address or how, what kind of self-awareness do you bring to the fore as someone who does mapping himself? Yeah, the kind of... Uh, the short answer is that I struggle. Uh, <laughs> but I think the, the uh, longer answer is that uh, there, is, there is a more positivist side to mapping where you really don't need anyone else. You have the analytical tools, the data, the algorithms, the ability to do your mapping in today's digital mapping that, that we are trying to do. And you're good to go. You can make the map. But I think the, this is your imagination of a certain territory and your representation of that territory. But I think for that to have the acceptability that might be needed, the, the question that I think one needs to keep asking is a map to what end? What are, real, what are we really trying to make of the map? What are we trying to do with the map? Why do we need the map? And I think to, it, it, it's more when I consider that question that I, uh, I see the huge chasms between a map that I can prepare through deployment and application of technology with the map that actually makes sense for a particular purpose or for a, for a, for a uh, you know, that's, that's a much more purpose built. And I think there it's, so for instance, with the uh, uh, map that we've been trying to make of open natural ecosystems, uh, one of the things we are, it's very easy to, it's relatively easy to map land cover. But what actually matters on the ground is how the land is being used. To give you an example, pastoralism, they would see all of these lands as rangelands. A rangeland is not, is defined by its use. If you take your goat and sheep and cattle and camels and graze them on a grassland, that's rangeland. If you graze them in a scrubland, that's rangeland. If you graze them in a forest, that's rangeland. So it's not one kind of a thing. So for us to actually have a map that makes sense to a community or, or the, uh, academic or otherwise that is focused on the use of these landscapes and is, is, is a far bigger challenge. And I don't think we have answers, but, but I think uh, it's something that one really needs to uh, keep grappling with. I, I don't know. I don't know if I have an answer to how it needs to be done, but I think the, the, what we are trying to do is have conversations conversations that tell us where our maps fall short and why they don't make sense and why we really need to be doing more work than merely churning out maps by writing code and clicking 
uh, buttons. Can I am Prem Chandavarka, I am an architect. Um, in a way, this is a follow-up to Janavi's question, but uh, if one looks at map, European maps of the world from about the 10th century to the 16th century, the 10th century maps are very... Uh, inaccurate, very approximate with vast gaps with no data. And around the 13th century when uh, ocean going navigation, the skills pick up, suddenly you, you see a sort of a sea change in the accuracy of maps. So in a way the maps are a repository of the memories of journeys undertaken. So can one use that to call for a redefinition of the idea of a map from uh, being an authoritative representation to being a repository for the marking of memory, presence, imagination, and one's relationship with the map is much more ongoing, dynamic, and public. Uh, so does the future lie in initiatives like OpenStreetMap, which is yeah. looking for publicly editable geographic databases of the world, especially now that satellite mapping has made the expertise of the surveyor, which was essential to making cartography a specialist domain. But the survey is now less relevant in the whole picture. Uh, sorry, is there, is there a, uh, did you have a specific uh, question? A, a response to that commentary. Uh, yeah, I think the, the element of time, of being able to, uh, you know, create the imprint of a memory and, and to be able to uh, obtain the, a picture of change. I mean, I, I'm looking at it like a scientist. You really would have to have a series of maps. And through such a series of maps, would one actually be able to represent this? And I think over, uh, over the years, what has happened is precisely because of the, uh, the, the way in which mapping has been exclusive, as uh, you also mentioned, it's it's not and it's not been accessible. This part has been very uh, very hard because in the particular in the states or the power or, or, or the more powerful people seeing the territory a certain way, if the, the, the an aspect you cared about is documented and documented over time, you actually have the ability to see uh, how how that has changed. Otherwise, it's 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 not on the map at all. So it's off the map. Uh, but I think to your comment about what changed in between 10th and 13th century, I mean, if I understand uh, correctly, I think there was also this huge this rediscovery of Ptolemy's uh, Geographia or, or, or whatever that was called, this eight-volume work, which I think fundamentally his, his entire way of having multiple projections and, and being able to map the world uh, in, in, in much more rigorously uh, was lost to most places for nearly a millennia, and and over the and it was only if I recall correctly around after the uh, 11th century or around the 10th century or afterwards I may be wrong about this that it was rediscovered and it became available and I think that that completely changed uh, the the ability of maps to represent uh, the uh, the earth. The, the curved surface of the arch much better on a, on a two-dimensional surface. That, that's one of the things I recall as well. We will, we will be taking our last three questions from members of the, from Oman, our two members of the audience here. So, Oman, please. Okay, sure. Uh, Madhu, lovely talk as always. Um, I was going to, uh, the question I wanted to ask was uh, uh, maybe a very solution oriented question, which is, I think maybe, you know, we are underestimating the intentionality behind producing the maps, because I'm sure when uh, Nitin produced that Soliga map, there was a certain, certainly an intentionality about assertion of the Forest Rights Act, or when the degraded map was produced, it was probably a recognition that Lantana camera is taking over and so on. Uh, but recognizing that these were were created for different purposes doesn't necessarily help in reconciling when we, for example, want to start a restoration project. 
right? right? So if you want to start kind of saying, how do we fix it? And maybe that's not, not even the right way to look at your, your talk. So maybe that's the wrong direction to take it. But if you have a conversation about what should we do in BRT, then I'm not, sh my, my question is, I understand you said those different maps are useful to start a conversation. My question to you is, is there a good way to have the conversation instead of people uh, kind of, uh, you know, being in a Tower of Babel, each one's kind of showing their map and saying my map says something different. Is there a way of driving those different maps and actually driving a conversation towards some sort of c convergence or understanding? Or do we just have to live with everybody yelling at each other, holding a different map? I think, uh, thank you, Veena. The, the, uh, the point that, that's really, that really stands out here is that the reason these maps, it's so frustrating to and, and not to have a sense of how to bring all of these together is one must only guess what the intent of these maps are. It, if, if only it were clearer, if only that intent was made clearer, I think it would focus every conversation on the different, in, it's, we, it's fine, we can still have a range of different maps. But I think if the intent of a map is clearer, then I think the, the way other groups of people who look at other facets can relate to it is much, much, much better. So are we interested in the forest as a legal frontier or are we interested in the forest as a biological frontier? If there is clarity on this, then we won't have to keep triangulating and guessing what is happening with our forest, seeing two numbers in report after report, not knowing what to make of it. If it is clear to us that the intent here is to re record the uh, forest as a biological uh, frontier, then I think it becomes much clearer for people to come and relate and for conversations to be had. So right now, that is completely uh, you know, obscured. The intent of any of these maps is unknown. One has to imagine, often we probably do it very incorrectly, and that I think is what, what really makes the transaction cost to all of these interactions much, much harder and deeply frustrating. Hi, uh, my name is Ishan. Um, I'm an ecologist uh, who was a scientific ecologist, now a political ecologist. So I really found your talk really nice, nicely compiled. Uh, some of the things I was aware of, uh, but generally the, the case studies and examples in the end were very helpful. Um, I was reflecting on probably more the politics of mapping and, and how mapping our ecosystems, um, you know, allows the, you know, the, the commodification of our different, uh, you know, more than human life uh, ecosystems, uh, all of that. Um, so I was, I don't know if this is a question or not, but if you have an insight or, or comment on this, but how can we leverage this academic understanding of how, uh, you know, the politics of mapping, you know, in our country around different, different ecosystem areas, how that can be challenged or how um, you know, we can hold to account the specific uh, stakeholders uh, to drive better political action towards safeguarding the interests of our ecosystems, especially in an era of uh, you know, drastic ecological breakdown. Uh, do you have any insight on that or comments? No, that's, 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 a, that's a bit, we, we can talk about that. I can, and I'm happy to share what I feel, but I don't have a very, uh, short and succinct answer to give you. I just wanted to comment also on intent. Yeah, I'm, I'm Uma, sorry. And uh, I think there is very clear intent, right? There is. I'm, I'm so, sure there I is. mean, you can say that it's not known or whatever, but there is very clear intent and there's different intent. So, I guess his question, I mean, the conversation has actually been following that uh, trail and his question is kind of the last one there. What do we do about it? How do we, knowing the intent, come to a conversation or consensus to move forward? Because even pointing out that, you know, these things are not, I mean, there's a disconnect and there no, is I, intent I, or there I, may be I, intent. I, I disagree there. I don't think we know the intent. I think we infer the intent. And I think that inference is not, like I was saying, with the Forest Survey of India maps, mm. I, it, it is still unclear to me if we are mapping the forest as a biological or a legal domain. 
and that is unclear so because if you are or functionally even if you are looking at it biologically you could be looking at it structurally in terms of what species it contains and what qualifies it as a forest or you could reduce the entire forest to its to one functional value and say carbon and then a coconut tree as is as good as uh, as, as some rainforest tree so you can you could reduce it to, to such a uh, but but that has never been clear or if you took the wastelands it's the wastelands started out much more in the context of how to bring how to value land and bring it under under uh, larger forms of of increasing productivity defined in a certain way but over time it became an a, an exercise which was where a large part of it was to uh, make more land available to cultivators to make marginal cultivation more productive and now a large part of the impulse really seems to be to make all those lands accessible to large scale conversion and and make those lands accessible to a variety of application of private capital in order to generate uh, other kinds of value so i think the intent of a wasteland map has they they've all been evolving and i think it's still uh, not very 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 clear and i think this has to be repeatedly inferred and if, i mean it's it's okay to state the obvious i think it, rather than for us to assume it it's always better for this to be stated more openly and i think that would make for a for a far better uh, collective engagement with the map and 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 a better representation of the territory of which the map is thanks yeah thank you Uh, madhu thank you for that uh, i mean you know i think the the well it's not in the elephant in the room but it is the elephant on the planet climate change right now the maps that you are defining uh, or you are discussing are also talking about where you know where where is the terrestrial biosphere going right i mean they are going to be important for that right yeah. uh, and and if and if you don't understand that we are not going to understand or even be able to grapple with what we are facing in terms of climate change so in some sense yes. there is an, there has to be an intentionality which goes beyond uh in absolutely the, the absolutely right? so so how do you how do you deal with that i mean i can tell you how i am thinking of dealing with it i think the 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 points that i think we've talked about uh about the the intent being much more implicit rather than explicit i think we the so for instance to look at the histories of our lands and waters if it is even in a narrow sense of sequestering carbon in the atmosphere that that our vegetation natural vegetation or otherwise provides a certain role i think it if for us to start conversations about what these maps uh, uh, about about mapping these areas that is not looking at uh looking at nature or or the the functions that it provides in a very narrow way but much more in in a much more inclusive way i think that's that's going to be really important so to that end i think it it's important for a group of for for people uh, groups of people to sit down and actually state this much more explicitly and say what it is that they would like a map to do because what is it that we need to know what that we don't and and i think out of those the maps that come out of those then the maps that are drawn merely because they are technically possible to do without with with all the intent behind them being uh, unclear i think those are the kinds of maps that are likely to help much more so i think there is an added transaction cost because you really have to figure out what it is that you are uh, in uh, driving at and that's not something uh, and until you've got that figured out you can't really get to the mapping and i think it's 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 going to be iterative it's going to be so it's a less than perfect process it's a process of collective action and these are really not the the impulse of science where is is not really collective in that sense this is a much more political way of bringing people of technical expertise to kneel down with 
with people who who don't have very technical uh, understanding of it and yet may have things of value to contribute that i think is 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 a hard thing to do so i think an, an aspiration to have say something like an open land cover map of india that is more broadly owned than one one agency that produces it would be a very valuable thing for people who disagree to have actually worked together to produce a consensus category of land cover which 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 represents this as 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 a place in a much more uh, uh, in in a social context or as 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 something that represents ecological function would be very valuable and i think that is a, that's a lot of investment and and i think we we ho i hope we will uh, slowly warm up to it because that's really where i think uh, the change is most promising yes there was no pun intended right <laughs> <laughs> on that note we'd like to bring this uh, event to a close thank you all for joining us on this rainy sunday evening for a very thought provoking lecture by madhu thank you madhu thank you sir